Hey, welcome to Father in Our Future, the podcast for dads. I'm Anthony Vandegrift, and I'm not the perfect dad, but every day I am trying to be better. I have a good friend with me today. His name is Greg Peters. Greg, yeah, thanks for so much for being with me. Yeah, man. Wonderful podcast. Glad to be a part of this. Thank you. I'm happy to have you on the podcast. I'm very appreciative to have Greg with me today, not just because he gave me some time out of his busy schedule, but because he's going to talk about something that is not particularly easy. And I appreciate the vulnerability and the openness to do that because I know that there are are other dads in a similar situation and I think I think you've handled what you've what you're going through with grace and I think you're doing a wonderful job and so I think you can be a great contributor to this oh, conversation um, in short just for everyone listening today Greg's youngest daughter has she was born with CDLS that's right and I know that that has brought changes and challenges into the house, and you and your wife have had to adapt and do your best to carry on, and I think a lot of people probably struggle with that. I would imagine there's a big mental and emotional toll that that parents feel when everything is not quote-unquote normal. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and so that's what Greg's going to help us with today, and I hope that at the end of this podcast, all, everyone listening, I hope that what you get out of this is some inspiration and motivation as parents, as dads. But I also hope, especially if you find yourself in a similar situation as Greg and his wife, that you realize you're not alone in what you're doing, that there's a community out there that will uphold and support you through your struggles and through your challenges. So let's dive into this. First off, I don't know exactly what it is but I'm sure you're familiar with it now. Can you tell us what CDLS is? Yeah, of course. And thanks again for having me on this podcast. Yeah, it's my uh, pleasure. CDLS is an acronym for Cornelia DeLange syndrome. It is uh, a genetic abnormality that starts usually uh, at conception or immediately after and then replicates. And so uh, you can think of other genetic complications, uh, a more popular one, of course, is would be Down syndrome. Um, there are some facial characteristics and there are some growth characteristics about these children uh, that makes it quite obvious that you know there's something different about them. Uh, CDLS is a lesser known um, but similar um, genetic abnormality. About one in ten thousand children in the United States will be diagnosed with this and. If I may, uh, similar to autism, there is a scale of severity with this particular okay. um, genetic illness. So it can range from people who don't even know they have it, frankly. Mm, wow. They uh, grow up, they have children, and um, their children test positive for this and then come to find out it was inherited through their parents. Wow. And then you can have the the far other end of the spectrum where um, it's clear that you, sure. there's something there's something not yeah. normal, uh, if I may say the word normal, right. uh, about uh, your child. So that's what CDLS is. Uh, a little girl had it many many years ago, and uh, it's it's been more diagnosed recently. I think just because as science advances and people start to assign names and and, and then the way they test, you know, they can isolate what exactly each of these things is. You know, they've been mapping the genetic sequences of the gut and, and of, of the brain and the blood now for many years. And those advances are causing medicine and doctors to, to understand better um, the particular abnormalities of each case. Gotcha. Okay. So that's what your, that's what your youngest has. Can you give us some of those uh, characteristics you mentioned, like you know, if you see someone with with Down syndrome, there's very telling facial features. What are some of the telling features with CDLS? Yeah, so one of the most interesting features you could actually see on an ultrasound as the child grows in the womb, uh, they will have very long eyelashes. This is something okay. that um, obviously every female in, in our world seems yeah. to, <laughs> Envies. to want. <laughs> right. You know, and the fact that you can see it on the ultrasound tells you how pronounced it is. And they're beautiful and they're long. Um, but that is a characteristic, characteristic feature of a CDLS child. Wow. Um, there are other um, abnormalities that will 
depend on the severity of the illness. Um, Micronathia is something where the chin, the whole jaw is actually recessed. And so you would also maybe think of it as an overbite, Um, but it can get extreme to the point where it complicates the airway, which is what our daughter um, dealt with at birth. There are also um, interesting features such as um, dwarfism or uh, stunted growth. So if you look at the growth chart of a child, you're going to see a uh, curve going quite vertical, and then it will begin to level off as they get older. With a CDLS child, the curve starts lower, the acceleration is slower, and it levels off well lower than even the lowest fifth percentile of other children that do not have this uh, abnormality. So Remy is small. We go into a store. Oh, how old is your child? 18 months. <laughs> and they say, really? Wow. You know, they don't quite know what to say. Right. Uh, she's small. Uh, people, when they hold her, if you have a year and a half year old child, you will normally hold them in a different way than you would an infant. Well, people like to hold my daughter, Remy is her name, um, as an infant. And Remy does not want to be held as an infant. She wants to be held as a year and a half year old. So it's quite comical, you know? And so you'll, you'll tell people that it's tough. They yeah. don't always get it, but right. the ones that do, I give them extra props. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. Okay. So your daughter was born diagnosed with CDLS. Before we get into some of the challenges of the journey, let's let's start here. You and your wife had two kids, two, you know, for lack of a better term, quote unquote, normal kids, yeah. happy, healthy. And then you made the decision to have a third. Now, was this something that you talked about? Was it always a plan? I know like when me and my wife were engaged, it was, I would like two to four. She went at four to six. Yeah. She is <laughs> she is not on the four to six boat anymore. But how did that work for y'all? Uh, probably just the natural course of a conversation between spouses. You know, the wife um, will generally drive those conversations, but not always. I have friends in both camps. So my wife um, asked, hey, what would you think if we had another? And, you know, my response is, well, we're going to be uh, overran. Yeah. You know, right now we've at least got a fighting shot. We have two right. kids. They are both still quite young. At that time, they were ages four and two. And so bringing another one on would be great. Um, I wasn't particularly against it. Uh, my wife, um, I think, has a very strong sense of purpose in her life. And for her to want that, um, I was not going to to push back against that if I felt like there was no obvious roadblocks. Sure. Uh, we had talked and have talked about adoption in our future, and perhaps we can get to this a little later in the episode. Um, but knowing that we wanted to foster and perhaps adopt in the future, you know, I start doing the math, start thinking about the financial side. But ultimately, um, Bringing children into the world is one of the greatest blessings Absolutely, that you can possibly have for yourself and your family. And so um, we said, okay, let's try. And um, it's not hard for me and my wife to get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> we, <laughs> let's just be real. So it didn't take long, and, and we were expecting. Yeah. Now, there was a comedic, at least it was comedic to a lot of us when we heard about it. So I had caught wind that you all wanted to have another kid. And then I caught wind that you were pregnant. But what did you find out when you found out you were pregnant? Yeah. uh, So she likes to surprise me. Um, All three of our kids, it's been very similar. You know, she'll bring the test and just kind of not give me any response. And normally she's this person who speaks in hyperbole. She's this very engaging and open person. And she's very muted when she does this. And she wants to see my reaction. And typically I'm sort of stunned into just, you know, okay, well, let's do it. Let's roll with it. So uh, I had already kind of been expecting it by our third child that, okay, we're probably going to get pregnant. It's probably not going to be too long. And, um, you know, what was the surprise later on was after one of the ultrasounds early on, she came back and uh, said, hey, Greg, um, you need to come right now to the ultrasound. And I thought, okay, God help us. What's going on? Yeah. So I'm driving over the speed limit, and I get to the ultrasound um, facility. I walk in. They rush me right in. She's waiting there with the tech. 
And um, Krista says, you know, just you, you need to see this. I said, okay. Um, the tech, you know, starts to, to do the probing and um, I'm looking at the screen. I don't really know what I'm looking no at. No one ever does. <laughs> it's all the fathers out there. You know what I'm saying, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. They're just lying to us. <laughs> um, and as, as the, the probe, you know, moves across, I, I feel like I'm seeing, I seeing double. And um, still, I, subconsciously, I think I know what I'm seeing, but consciously there's just, there wasn't that thought at all. And after just an interminable silence, you know, finally I'm like, are there two? <laughs> and, you know, the tech's like, well, what do you think? I was like, there's two. And they're like, yes, there's two babies. So perfect family. Yeah. Twins. Going for going for a third <laughs> and got a third and a fourth. My wife was over the moon, so excited. She had felt like there was twins. She had been telling people there was twins before we'd ever had a single ultrasound. Wow. Somehow she had an instinct that there was two babies in there. And um, for her to just to be right about that was really an incredible moment. Yeah, don't and question mama. <laughs> <laughs> it was... It, she just couldn't have been happier. I tell yeah. you what, we were on pace to have the perfect family, you know, four kids with the babies being twins. Can't ask for more, right? Even numbers, it all works out. Everybody's got a friend. Right. And uh, yeah, we were we were ready just to continue a, a fairy tale life, if you will. Yeah. So early on, that's how it started. But then it kind of took a bit of a change of course. So at what point did you at what point did you realize there were complications? Yeah, I remember um very vividly uh some things you know you get an inkling for and then some things are just a 15 ton megawatt nuclear warhead explosion in your face and this was definitely the latter. It was December of 2020 and we, by virtue of having twins, so I'll back up just a minute here. Um, my wife was getting more crunchy as time goes on, you know, and she was to the point where she wanted to try the home birth experience. And, you know, of course, that sounds fine. Whatever you want, dear, <laughs> we'll support you. And uh, once we found out we were having twins, uh, that was sort of out the window. They call that a um, high risk pregnancy just by virtue of there being two. So we set that aside and began to see an MFM, which I believe is a maternal fetal specialist. And um, they'll just monitor throughout a pregnancy of anything that's higher risk, right? Whether that's um, of, because of an illness they've already discovered in the ultrasound or whether um, there are more than one child in the womb. In our case, that's what it was. We went um, to them and there was an ultrasound. Um, our tech's name was Shelby and I remember it like it was yesterday. She was particularly quiet on this ultrasound, and we were just as bubbly as can be. We were still in that aura of, of the twins and, and talking about what life was going to be like and what we were going to do as they came along. And I remember she just was very quiet. And, you know, we um, saw her, her leave, and then uh, Dr. Rubio came in just a few moments later, and he kind of looked at us and you could just tell he he had something to say. And we sat there as he began to reveal to us uh, in in full picture, you know, what was going on with our children. And one thing that I recall was the ultrasound was probably 15, 20 minutes. It took quite a while. Finally, towards the end of the ultrasound, we saw Nora, who was our twin. We saw her hand just held up, you know, suspended in, in animation. And we said, look, there's a hand. And only later did we come to realize that was the only hand we saw the whole time. As Dr. Rubio began to tell us um, about our children, he began to talk about the things that were not right. Um, he said their growth was a lot smaller um, than it should be even for twins. He mentioned that uh, there was a uh, micronathia diagnosis that was very clear just from the ultrasound. You know, you almost couldn't tell that these children had chins. They were so far recessed. He also said there were arm abnormalities. And so as he began to um, move the probe back across my wife's belly, he, we could tell 
yeah, there's no fingers. Mm. You know, there's there's something there, but there's not much except for uh, one of our girl's hands. She had one good hand. And then he showed, of course, the eyelashes that I talked about earlier, and this beautiful long eyelashes. And, and then began to tell us, there's a chance these babies, of course, will not live. But perhaps more fearfully than that at first was, there's a chance these babies could live a lot longer than you. You may be surprised, but to me, in my flesh, like in my humanity, that sort of struck more fear into me in that moment than I'm going to lose these children was, oh God, I'm going to keep these children that have severe issues. Yeah. And there's not just going to be one, there's going to be two of them. How in the world will I manage that? And that was, um, like I said, it was a bombshell. Sure. It was, we were in shock. And driving home that day, we were almost too stunned to cry. Just, you know, you, you soak up something like that. You can't do it in a day. It takes some time. And, um, yeah, that was, that was when and how we found out that something was wrong. Wow. So at what point, how, how far away was due date? Was the delivery from when you found out? That was at 20 weeks gestational. <clears throat> As most fathers know, perhaps first time dads, you know, 40 to 42 weeks will be full term. So we were about halfway through a full term pregnancy. And uh, we did not know it at the time, but um, our daughters would be born at week 31. So for the next 11 weeks, uh, we walked um, through this through this challenge, uh, to say the least, um, trying to figure out what is our next step, right? Can what do we do? All options on the table. Can I ask you what you do? What did you do in those 11 weeks to try and navigate that? Because like you said, yeah, that's a nuclear bomb that gets dropped on you. Yeah. Uh, we, I'm sure your mind goes everywhere. It does. You know, you think about all sorts of outcomes, um, you really battle what what one part of you wants versus what perhaps the purpose of your life is and, and the purpose of you being here on the world. Um, those things, particularly which for those that um, have a walk with God, you know, that is an important question to ask. Mm -hmm. um, certainly we had already posted on the social media channels the beautiful pictures of of how you announce twins that was already out there and so of course there's going to be feelings of inadequacy feelings of shame it just goes without saying if there's anything wrong with your child you're going to feel that uh, for us it was particularly pronounced given the severity of the challenge we faced um, and yet those 11 weeks um, they were very different than the first two pregnancies because we knew that so far everything was okay. There was nothing to fear except the fear of something perhaps showing up. Well, with these babies, all of that was out in the open immediately. And so those fears were immediately realized. And perhaps that was even a blessing looking at back that I, we were able to just soak that in and then say, okay, this is a massive tectonic shift in our lives. Um, when will the ground stop shaking? We don't know, but we had, a strong tribe around us. I'll say this, you know, as you're um, a father or will be a father, try and build up a tribe around you. Build up friendships and relationships and, and leaders and pastors in your life and, and be the kind of person that will have a good support group around you because eventually it may be something with your children, it may be something with your health, it may be something with your finances. Who knows? You will need that, that group of people. And um, having that in our lives really made a world of difference yeah. as they began to to come um, to our aid. Uh, even as we had poured into them over the years, it all of a sudden that current reversed. It's a beautiful thing. And it began to pour into us in, in all sorts of ways. So you're going through that for 11 weeks. Mm -hmm. Delivery date finally comes. What happens? What's that like? Yeah. So it, they were born at 31 weeks. And at 29 weeks, uh, we had done an, another ultrasound follow-up. At this point, we were having ultrasounds every week. Mm. And 
we realized at that point that Nora um, wasn't going to make it. Wow. You so, realized that at 29 weeks? At 29 weeks, yep. Mm. So we lost her right around that time. And for Remy's sake, her sister, um, we couldn't just deliver because it would be an even greater risk to Remy. At this point, Nora is not even a pound. Remy is, I think, somewhere between one and two pounds. Wow. They're both very tiny. They both have mouths um, just maybe a centimeter in diameter. They're very, very, very small children. Wow. Even if they're born, you know, there's no um, guarantee that the doctors can intubate them um, so that they can have the, the breathing support they need to survive. But um, we realized once we realized we were going to lose Nora, that was a very, very hard decision for my wife um, and myself. What do you do? Is there a right answer? Like, yeah. you don't even think of these questions, you know? You have a, a child who's no longer alive in, in your womb and another which is. Um, so for two weeks, uh, my wife carried her children, one who had passed. And of course, you know, we would feel a kick on her belly and, and, and it was on the, the, the side that Nora was on. And we thought, maybe God healed her. Maybe she's back alive again. And, you know, come to find out Remy at that point was just growing more than Nora. And she was kind of stretching across where Nora was. And, um, you know, those those times were, were hard. And we had, I'll say this, you know, we had some of the best conversations of our marriage during this, this period of pregnancy, particularly those last 10 weeks. You know, questions you, you don't ever think about, you, you're asking now. Um, things that you never would have considered you're trying to, to flesh out. And it really brings a certain reality and it, it cuts away the superficiality, right, of a conversation, of a, of a relationship. Um, we knew statistically, we're both, I, th- I would say we're both pretty avid readers, that this was either going to tear us apart and just completely crush us into the soil or it was going to bring us together. Mm -hmm. And so we made a choice for it to bring us together. So those 11 weeks really turned out to be a a catalyst for our marriage. And they bonded us in a way that maybe it would have taken decades to do otherwise. Sure. You know, I'll say my wife was my best friend, but she now is, is beyond a doubt somebody I'm way more intimate with than I ever could have been. And, you know, trials do that to you. Yeah, that's an awesome thing. It's nobody wants conflict. Nobody wants challenges and trials, but they serve a purpose. And there's there's beauty that usually comes from the ashes. Yeah. Um, that's I didn't know that about your story. That's a really neat thing. So, delivery date. Remy's Remy's in the world now. Mm-hmm. What was that like? I mean, yes, you already knew she had complications. And typically, and you've had this twice with your other two kids. I've had it three times. You know, you get to see the the baby immediately. Yes. And they're with you. Was there anything different with Remy? Yeah, <laughs> there definitely was. It, <laughs> it was in the middle of the night and our labors had typically taken up to a day, sometimes a little over a day for my my son but with Remy, um, there was also a risk of her just being born because she was so tiny um, before um, she needed to be born. And there was a risk to my wife as well. Hmm. So um, my wife felt her water break and we headed to the hospital dead of night, February. It was a week after a an ice storm, which is rare here where we live here in Texas. And... Uh, Thank God it was a week after that. We get to the hospital. We had just switched from one hospital to uh, Parkland, which uh, I, coincidentally was where my wife had spent 10 years as um, a critical care nurse. So we're wheeled in the Parkland. They don't have really any information on us. It's still all with the old hospital. They haven't transferred everything over. Uh, my wife's just frankly t- trying to tell them the things that she wants, you know, for Remy, you know, I've got one child in here. Here's what they have. Um, here's how big she is. Um, and it's a blur for me, of course. It's the middle of the night. Sure. But 
they start to work her up and within like 15 minutes of us being there, they're already willing her back to the OR, right? So it's, they're like, we got to get this baby out. It's time. So I'm gowning up, rushing after them, um, scrubbing, whatever they call it, scrubbing up. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, get back there, go into the OR at Parkland. I kid you not, there's 30 doctors, nurses, anesthesiologists, right? All sorts of people. I had no idea what all these people were doing in this room, in this OR. They were, it was packed and it feels so surreal. My wife is, you know, already there. They're, they're already opening her up to get the, the babies out. And um, one kind nurse, you know, guides me to where Krista's sitting. So I get to roll up the chair right next to her head. And, you know, I'm doing my best as a dad to comfort her, telling her, you know, I'm here. I love you. It's going to be all right. Um, I'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking not next to me. There's, there's a river flowing next to me. It's just, uh, without getting too graphic, it was, yeah. it was very scary. Sure. Um, and I hear them say, okay, we've got baby. And I look to my left and I see them holding up a child way up in the air, like almost like holding up a pizza as you're walking through yes. a busy restaurant, you know? Uh, and they're walking over to uh, the resuscitation table. And um, I just caught enough of a glimpse. I'm like, okay, that was a baby. And uh, of course, they were prioritizing Remy because Nora had already passed. And so as they were um, finishing up, um, getting Nora uh, birthed, they were working on Remy. And at this point, we thought either they intubate her or she passes. And if she's if they cannot intubate her, we said, hey, five minutes most. If you can't intubate her in five minutes, just bring her to us. We want to hold our baby. Hmm. There's a dignity to death that we had talked about. And we wanted to just be with her in those final moments. Well, um, a few minutes passed, and I realized that there are six people around the resuscitation table instead of 10. And then there were four. And then finally there were two. And that's enough room for me to go mosey on over. Sure. Um, you know, my wife's okay at this point. Um, I walk over and I don't see a tube coming out of Remy's mouth. And I think she's not intubated. So I ask, and you know, one of the 30 people in there, you know, like, what's, what's going on? And I, and they said, oh, she's breathing on her own. And I said, praise God, there's no way that they expect her to breathe on her own. And then I look at the numbers and 24 hours before she was born, we had our final um, doctor's visit again at the other hospital. She weighed in um, a little over two pounds, maybe like two pounds an ounce. I'm looking up there and it says she weighs two pounds, 13 ounces. Wow. And I thought there's no way she could have gained 12 ounces in 24 hours. What are you doing, God? You know, <laughs> you especially ask these questions at five <laughs> yeah. in the morning now. Right. And so we um, got to hold Nora, uh, who was at this point very tiny. And uh, that was a, a very hard thing to do having passed two weeks earlier. But with Remy, we were not able to hold her. She was whisked off into the NICU where she spent the next 90 days of, wow. of her life there um, growing and fighting death and fighting for life. And, um, you know, the next chapter of our journey was uh, the back and forth where all of a sudden, instead of being together in pregnancy, almost around the clock, uh, and particularly this is during COVID too. So right. we were together all the time. I was working from home. Now it's, we became ships passing in the night. My wife wow. is going up there in the daytime to be with Remy. I'm trying to get up there in the evenings after work and be with her either all night, if we didn't like the nurse. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know. It does happen. If it was somebody we trusted, then, yeah. um, you know, we would, I would sign out around 11 or 12 o'clock um, and then drive home and yeah. repeat. And so it just it, it wow. created a whole new set of circumstances for us um, in so many ways. Yeah. So are the emotional toils and the the mental struggles, are they the same kind of throughout from the point that you get the bad news of, hey, we have some complications, carrying on to, you know, you've lost Nora, carrying on to the delivery date and... I mean, the fact that she's breathing and weighs mm -hmm. 
12 ounces more 24 hours later is a really, really cool thing. Uh, but then she's in NICU for 90 days. I mean, how do you hold yourself together? Because this is exciting at the very beginning. You're having twins. It wasn't the plan, but it's better than what you hoped for. And then what you thought you were getting, what you're hoping for, totally changes. I mean, yeah. through that, how, how do you hold yourself together? I don't know that you do. You know, there's moments that that's the dynamics and the beauty of life. You'll have days or hours or moments where you don't hold it together. That's okay. Yeah. You know, we, we need that outlet. <clears throat> um, I am particularly, I would say, blessed to be able to disassociate from a lot of emotions. I think big picture is just how I'm wired. And so uh, I had had so much time to think about all of this. But what I think was different is the grind, right? When am I going to get to be with my wife? When sure. am, is our family going to get to be together for the first time? My children don't didn't get to see Remy for the first 90 days. Wow. My parents didn't get to see her. Her parents didn't get to see her. It was me and Krista and no other support because of COVID. Yeah. And I know many people have stories about, you know, the challenges of COVID and loved ones. And, um, you know, I feel for you. And I, I know, and in some sense, you know, what it's like for those people. You know, one of the the blessings, I, again, I said earlier, it was a coincidence, but um, I just believe it was providence. It was the hand of God that we were at Parkland and that we switched over literally a day before um, Remy was born. Because Krista had worked there for almost a decade, she knew the doctors. She knew yeah. a lot of the nurses. She knew the techs. She, she, she knew a lot of people. Sure. And one of the um, girls in our wedding, shout out to Leslie. <laughs> She was still a NICU nurse at Parkland. Gotcha. Guess who our primary nurse was on assignment with Remy? It was Leslie. That's cool. We had somebody who knew us, who was very close to us, um, to be our, our primary. And then she had a, a good friend, um, also a critical care nurse, who was just one of the best. And she asked if she could be her backup. And so immediately we just felt like, wow, you've given us the two best nurses and I'm sure they're all great, but we felt like you gave sure. us the best of the best. And you don't typically have that level of rapport either where you can actually tell the nurses and the doctors, like, here's what's going on. Usually they're probably like, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yep. We're going to, we're the doctors, <laughs> we'll figure it out. But in that, in that context, yes. Krista having worked there for 10 years and then still having friends there. Yes. That was, that was super helpful considering that it was the day before you switched. It was incredible. Wow. Yeah, they also, Parkland also has a uh, family support um, team. Uh, there's two young ladies there who um, came and helped us and were just a friend to Krista and were able to be like an emotional support to her because the nurses are very busy. You know, they they, right. they work them yeah. very hard. They have yeah. multiple kids they take care of. Especially during COVID times. Especially during COVID yeah. times. Wow. So, so, so many things came together for us that made um, the overwhelmingness made you just step back and realize, okay, either there's a God in heaven who's guiding your life or there's not. And in that sense, I think it's a binary choice. And for us, we choose to believe that he does guide us. Yeah. And we saw all these mile markers along the way, his hand upon us, things that are just beyond a coincidence. Sure. I would choose to say they're miraculous or they are supernatural. Um, too many occurrences, yeah. right, for it to be otherwise. That's my story. Yeah, that's fantastic. So let's pick it up from, you, you finally, let's, I'll call it a sense of normalcy, but you're not, you know, going back and forth to the NICU. Remy's home. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can fill in some of the gaps, but I'm thinking at the point where you start bringing Remy to church. Mm -hmm. you, you're doing your best to what appears to be carrying on with life and then making her a part of it. Was, was, that, a, was that a difficult choice to make? Or what, what got you to the point of, I don't know what else to call it other than maybe acceptance. Like this is our new reality and we're going to carry on. Yeah, it's a great word, acceptance. You know, you do have to accept your situation 
um, even while believing for deliverance or um, that the situation will change or working through your situation, you still have to accept where you're at um, and able be to be able to process and deal with it. Uh, I'll say with Remy, again, it was still COVID. Um, we were coming out of it. This is now February of 21. We were going to church and not too many other places. Our life was really the hospital, um, the kids, their their daycare and, and, and church. Mm-hmm. And so bringing them in, into this community was not hard to do. There's so many people that already knew the story. We're sure. anticipating meeting Remy. Um, Remy's life, we had realized, was at once tenuous and yet super strong at the same time. She had a, a tenacity to live, which is the reason why she was still alive. And yet we knew at any moment she could she could go. She could wow. pass. And to this day, that, that has not changed. Wow. Um, we have her on a oxygen monitor at night and that thing will just drop. And, uh, for those who are, you know, in the medical field, you know, you can't have O2 levels in the fifties and sixties for very long. Sure. Uh, and so for her, for that to happen and for her to do that so quick, you know, we're trying to figure out, is it reflux? Is it neurological? What is it? But the reality is, is we don't know, but we realize Life is is a delicate balance here, and yet she's surpassed expectations. You know, she's very strong and very strong willed, and I don't know where she gets that from. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So we've um, we've had our challenges, but I think what really was the poignant moment was when I took her out into society at large. We began to go out again as the restrictions lifted, right? We went to the bowling alley or to um, Brahms, you know, to get some ice cream for the kids. Mm -hmm. And I'm holding Remy and people just can't help but stare. Sure. Uh, Remy has one finger on one hand. She has two fingers on the other hand and she has clear facial characteristics. Um, people are just sort of absorbing, you know, most people aren't judging. They're just, it takes you a second to register what you're seeing. Sure. As I got used to this, if you can ever get used to it, I suppose, um, knowing this, my personality is one where I don't typically care, you know, what other people think Mm -hmm. Um, probably is um, an indictment upon my sense of style, which my wife tries to help me with. (laughs) 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 But I, I, I did notice this. It was too. It was too hard not to notice. And so, in trying to mold that in your mind and roll that around and figure out how do I respond, you know, I came to the point where they're going to be looking at this baby in my arms, me holding. But then their next, their eyes are going to invariably lift up to my eyes. Well, what will my countenance be? And I resolve to have a big smile and an engaging attitude. And to say, hey, how are you doing? This is Remy. Do you want to say hello? Wow. And would you believe that almost everybody reacts positively to that? You know, they want to know your story. The blessing is, is when I'm holding Remy, I can ask anybody just about anything. Well, wow. Because she opens that door. Sure. Right? I don't have superficial conversations if I don't want to, if I'm holding Remy. She's an opening. She's a get out of jail free card. She's a, she's a she's a pass to get into real conversations with people yeah. and talk about real issues and real victories and yeah. whatever they want to talk about, you know. And so, um, as somebody who wants to be a positive agent for change in this world, mm-hmm. that is a tremendous blessing wow. for our family and for myself. Wow. Yeah. It seems like you've taken something that a lot of people would view as as a obstacle and a hurdle in life and you've 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 seen how it can be utilized for a greater good um that's very admirable uh, i don't i don't think a lot of people do that i i would and i could be wrong again i'm not in the situation i'm just making assumptions from the outside looking in but i i would just imagine myself in that situation 
just constantly, you know, boggling in your mind back and forth. How are we going to do this? Mm -hmm. Why did this happen? What am I supposed to do? And never really landing on a particular answer. And like you said, there might not be an answer that you really land on, but you still have to take the initiative to go out and to do something, which is what y'all have done. I know there's probably more that could be said. And before I ask you the final question of, you know, advice that you would give, is there anything that you want to add to the story that you think people should know? Is is there anything that you'd like to go back and comment on? I know you'd mentioned something about adoption Mm -hmm. earlier on. Anything else that you'd like to throw in here? Um, No, I think, you know, we could talk forever. It's, It's my story. Everybody has their story. Right. And I think it's all in how you approach life, right? What are your goals in life? And when something comes in and and blows those goals to smithereens, um, what is your purpose for life? And I think that no matter what comes, if you work on that question, why am I here? If you don't know the answer to that, um, I hope you you look and find purpose because everybody has purpose in life. Sure. I'm absolutely convinced. Sure. We are all here for a reason. And if you have a purpose, then how do the trials and challenges fit into that purpose? You know, I'll say this in closing for me, um, looking back, I had always prayed, God, I need you to do what you whatever you have to do to save my family. Mm-hmm. And then Remy comes along. And then I realize she's broken us free of some social constraints. She's giving us a very visceral perspective of this world. And she's also unlocked for us um, some things that are freedom for us, right? We don't have to push to look like everybody else because there's no way we'll look like everybody else. We're, We're so far removed from that now. It's an entirely different conversation. And seeing the questions and the answers that my six-year-old now asks and or questions and then I attempt to answer, you know, they're always very thought-provoking questions, but because of life circumstances, they're they're really deep questions. Sure. And it's setting the course of her life um, to have a very strong balance in life. Yeah. And in a sense, I feel like this will serve us well as these kids get older. This Remy will help tether us to the need for God. Right. Because we can't do this without him. Right. And so, in a sense, I feel like, and for me, there's no way I'm going to try and do this without the Spirit of God helping me. Sure. I would be crazy to. Right. People are like, well, how do you get to church all the time? I'm like, why would I not go to church all the time? Where yeah. else can I go? Yeah. I need God's hand in this. And again, that goes back to my life's vision, which is I have a purpose and I have a calling. Right. And Remy is a part of that. Remy is an answer to that. Right. I think that's a remarkable outlook because from the biblical perspective, we all have a calling of identity. We're all called to be disciples. And it doesn't matter what your environment is. It doesn't matter your occupation. It doesn't matter the context of life. You were called to be a disciple before Remy. Remy comes along and you're still called to be a disciple. And... I think it's admirable because you have clearly, you and your wife both have lived that out to where you've you've remained consistent even through what some people could view as tragedy. Mm. And you've accepted the new reality, but you've not lost the identity part. Exactly. And, and I think I think that's very key. While I'm not going through the same storm, I do know that when storms come my way that my identity of a disciple has to stay in place. It does. That, that has to remain. It does. It's a fantastic story, and I'm, I'm, th- I'm thankful that you've shared this with us. The last thing that I want to ask you is, living through this, Remy is how old now? Remy is 18 months okay. old. Okay. So living through this for the last 18 months, and honestly, several weeks before that, You've had experiences, you've learned things, you have had failures along the way, I'm sure. What advice would you give to other dads who have children born with defects or 
complications? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I mean, obviously you would know uh, conceptually it's not easy. It's just not, right? And if you're in that space or have a child with challenges, then then you know you have a testimony as well that this is tough. Um, my advice, you can't do it without God. You have to have God helping you. No. And I hate to be that simple, but it's also my belief is that's why I'm here, right? Sure. I was created to have a relationship with God. And so what's he doing bringing Remy into our life? And I choose to believe he's got a purpose for that. Yeah. And so if you try and do this on your own, if you try and do it with everybody without God, I think you will come up wanting. Yeah. But if you push to say, God, perhaps you don't know him. You know, where are you, God? He will answer you. Sure. You will feel his spirit and begin to draw on your heart. And you may find that your challenge is actually the greatest blessing that you didn't know. That's awesome. Again, I don't have the same challenge, but I can share the testimony of I could not be a dad without God. Yeah. I don't know how we do it without the Bible as a guide. I I don't even know where I would begin. And it's it's comforting to know that if things escalate, if I face mm-hmm. new challenges, that where I'm at now, it's we're going to be the same. Yeah. Come what may, I still need God. God will still get me through it. God will still be faithful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for giving us your advice and your insight. Again, I know it's not an easy thing to talk mm-hmm. about, but I'm grateful that you did. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I know this is I know this is this is going to help. This was this was uplifting to me, and I know it's going to be uplifting to all the listeners. So, thank you again for your time, and I'm looking forward to seeing how your story continues to unravel, and maybe we'll have you back, get an update. I'm looking forward to it. I, I would love that. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, everyone, this is Father in Our Future, the podcast for dads. I'm Anthony Vandegrift. Thank you for being with me. And I hope you will join me next time. Hey, thanks for watching today's episode. I hope it has blessed you and challenged you to strive to be a better dad every day. And if you'd like more great content like this, just subscribe to the channel. Also, if you think dads are valuable and essential to the family, consider supporting this effort. Just go to fatheringourfuture.com and click support. Every contribution helps and it's greatly appreciated. Thank you for being a part of Fathering Our Future.